let's welcome. So Kate is our rising VM2. <laughs> Victoria is is our first year. So these ladies are going to tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, they're also going to um, tell you a little bit about their application. I am an incoming VM2. I am a DVM MPH student. I was born in California and spent seven years in Tucson, Arizona, where I did my undergrad in veterinary science with minors in biochemistry and special education. And then I started my MPH actually at the University of Arizona in their College of Public Health. Um, I was not in a financial position to apply to 10 plus schools. So I made the decision because my MPH there was a two year program that I would apply to my top five in the middle of my MPH and potentially leave if I got into one of my top five. And then if I didn't, I would be working and save up. And then I had a secondary list of, okay, now I'm done with my MPH. Let's go hard. And I think I, there was like 12 to 14 schools on that second list. I was offered admission at two schools, including Iowa. Um, I was the first class that they stopped doing interviews, but I actually came out in October of 2017 to an applicant day because I really felt drawn, especially being from the West Coast. Um, there's not a ton of recruiting from Midwest schools. Usually it's word of mouth. I heard really good things about this program and I knew they had a DVM MPH program. And when I came here in October, this immediately shot to the top of my list. Um, when I was getting ready for acceptance letters and calls, I was just, I knew that if Iowa was within one or two that I got into, that it was probably gonna push me over the edge and I was just gonna end up in school. Um, it was a little more expensive than the other school that I got into, but I did receive a scholarship, which immediately, like, I decided well before the deadline that this is where I was going. So, yeah. Oh, okay, so um, I'm from Perry, Iowa. I went to Iowa State for undergrad. Um, I'm kind of more of a what you call a normal student, I guess. I went for undergrad, <laughs> and I graduated this spring, and I'll be going to vet school in the fall here. Um, I actually only applied to Iowa State because I graduated in three years, so I was kind of just this is where I wanted to be, and so I was going to take four years and get a double major if I didn't get in, but it worked out, and I got in, so I'll be going in the fall. Um, that's kind of me. I think it's sort of interesting to be that both of us are back friends. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah. And so um, I had a lot of friends that like, well, what if you don't get into med school? It's possible. If you look at statistics, as an out-of-state student coming from a state that doesn't have an in-state med school, like I really was facing a lot of different schools who they want to look at their in-state students. That's fine. But that puts me at a disadvantage. And so I'm like, all right, so what if I don't get in? One, I have told this to all of my friends who have cried to me at 3 a.m., vet school and your passion for animals and your passion for one health or whatnot is just a single facet of who you are. It is not what defines you. You are a composite of so many different factors and contributions to this world that if you don't get into vet school, if you don't become a veterinarian, it is not just want to say that like that is super important and I know that all obviously all of you are here because you want to go to vet school but it's scary it's really really challenging as someone who didn't apply to just one school it's grueling and everyone wants to know like where are you at in the application process and you're like oh losing my mind over it a little bit and that's that can be really difficult so just know that it is a good idea to have a backup plan that's reasonable Mine was Masters of Public Health. I really love epidemiology. I'm still doing that. Um, if you guys have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer those. But just know that it is not a reflection of who you are as a person if when you apply, you don't get in the first time or if you just get waitlisted. So it's really important that in the back of your head, when you're going through imposter syndrome and you're unsure about how, why you're here, if you even deserve to be there, you do. It's about what got you to that point. That's my TED talk, um, but it's really important to keep that in the back of your head. Can you guys talk a little bit about uh, the unique experience that you've had? Uh, is it the unique platform that it is most connected to? Yeah. And talking about the actual click right, how did you actually get yourself? Okay. Right yeah. Um, so I was really involved, like, forever. Um, in high school, I was always involved. I was always a four-sport athlete, and I was in every club I could think of. 
um, just really involved. I continued that into college. I was in pre-vet club, uh, Vets Without Borders, like any club that involved animals. Um, and I gained leadership through that. Um, so I guess that's what, um, I guess for me, finding something that makes you unique in this uh, application process is really important um, because there's so many people you need to find out what makes you different. And for me, I really highlighted that leadership experience. Um, I also studied abroad multiple times, so I pointed out that and just kind of my um, involvement with everything. Um, as far as references go, I wanted to get like a div diverse one. So I'm pretty sure I asked two vets that I worked with um, throughout high school and then one from um, my undergrad. Um, I also worked throughout undergrad my whole time. I had a job at a vet clinic that I worked at for two plus years. Um, and then I also did jobs on campus, um, undergrad research um, and supplemental instruction leader. So if you don't know what that is, it's like a tutor, but for an entire class. Um, so that was for anatomy, which if you're still an undergrad, I highly recommend because you learn anatomy really well because you have to teach it to everyone. Um, so that was really fun. Um, so then I actually did the teacher I SI'd for. So um, I got to know her really well by working with her through the class. And so that was my academic reference. Um, you can also do like your advisor. My advisor wasn't the greatest. So she didn't really know me, I felt like. So I didn't use her. Um, and then I did somebody from a call or from high school that knew me really well from the activities I was in and that kind of thing, more of a personal reference. Um, I did ask a couple more people, um, but I always say ask more than what you want because like my advisor asked her, she didn't work out. Um, so I ended up with four solid ones, um, but I was looking to get five. So that was my, yeah. So fast. Um, <laughs> so um, I actually, while in high school, got a job at PetSmart and got into the University of Arizona transferred to a store. I actually worked at PetSmart for four and a half years. I ended up with a management role and then the company was bought and then I became the dog trainer. So a lot of like small animal miscellaneous pet retail experience on that aspect. At the end of undergrad, I decided I wanted to get my foot in the door in a vet clinic. I already knew that I didn't want to go into vet school right away. I didn't feel emotionally or animal experience wise ready and I thought that it would be a waste of money um, knowing my number of animal hours compared to average stats of different schools that you can look up. And so I actually applied and got into a low cost veterinary clinic with the spay neuters. They had three sites within Tucson, Arizona. And so I went around to all those different locations, sort of introduction to vaccine protocols and animal welfare and handling and kind of my interest in public health at that time. And Tucson's a really unique location. I know it's Arizona and everyone's like, it's cactus area. Like, yeah, that's kind of what it is, but um, we're really close to the Mexican border, and we have a lot of people who go back and forth, either residents of the United States or Mexico, and we had to do a lot of international stuff. Um, there's also a cultural aspect to that that you don't necessarily think of when you're out in the general public. Tucson is a really diverse population in general, but the veterinary side of it sort of is what piqued my public health interest. And so at that time, I actually applied to get into a veterinary technician program. For those of you who don't know, there are mandatory internships where you have to get a job at a clinic as part of the vet tech program. So I was like, oh, this is great. I get formal education. Um, this is my backup backup plan. Um, <laughs> if I, you know, don't get into vet school, I still have, you know, my licensure. And then I also get jobs and places in a clinic. Sounded like a good idea. I realized really quickly that it was not for me. Um, I was bullied is a really vague term, but it describes what happened. Um, and I just felt that I wasn't at home there and that if I wasn't feeling like I belonged here, that I shouldn't continue. And at that point, I had been looking at other mixed animal practices because the low cost clinic just couldn't provide me the hours that I needed to pay for bills and life things like food. And that's kind of important. So I got a job at a mixed animal practice that I stayed at then for um, two years I was there throughout my MPH too and it was awesome if it could fit in the door we saw it we worked with local wildlife um, and the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum I have never ever held a cara cara before which if you know what that is it is a large bird of prey that is protected and it was on loan from Mexico and it was super like 
crazy because it got bit by a scorpion or stung by a scorpion. We had to administer like human anti-venom. It was crazy, but I would have never had that experience had I not had that job. Um, I am a cat whisperer now. I've dealt with feral cats. I like to create horned owls. And I had a lot of skills that I got to hone in on that sort of made me realize that I really love public health. That practice had four different veterinarians there. I asked all of them for letters of prep because I worked on all of their different teams. Some clinics aren't like that. You're assigned to a team or you might be a primary technician. And so um, I was blessed enough that I had a wide range of those individuals. And the five schools that I applied for, one of them required someone who was my supervisor. I had asked my supervisor from PetSmart who had worked with me for almost all of the four years, but she had left and I did never get a response back from her. So one of the veterinarians at that practice was the practice owner. So he fit that role. Um, I also had to ask an instructor from the school. This is my loophole. She was also a veterinarian at the University of Arizona. And she was in the veterinary technician program. So she not only saw me in an academic setting, but also in an animal setting. So just know that if you do apply to more than one school, some schools do have reference requirements. So I had a total of five, and they were all different backgrounds from different schools. One of them did, you know, wildlife and exotics primarily. The other did mainly dogs and cats. And the other, again, um, the veterinarian who was my jack of all trades. She worked overnight at an emergency clinic. She worked at the University of Arizona, and she taught in the vet tech program. So, like, she did a lot of different things, and I got to help out with that. So I think that looking into your references and realizing that, one, they all have different aspects of them that they will be able to give feedback to about you is important. But the number of vets in your application does matter. And so if you can find a vet that's an instructor or if your advisor is a veterinarian, that's great. Double dip. There's no rules against that. Um, I really think that that played to my advantage. And oh, before I had received admission, I did get a job actually at an overnight emergency clinic. So I sort of wanted to be very well-rounded. Um, I don't want to do emergency medicine long term, but it was really valuable for me to realize that and to see that side of it. Um, my previous clinic had worked um, with different emergencies and we usually transferred to the center that I ended up at. And they also had specialists. So that was my first introduction to specialty medicine. Yeah. Uh, questions that you guys have for them? You guys can remember the first few. Sure. Your transfer. Is it possible to be you're in um, vet school. So, like, yeah. so sorry for all of you guys who are like, boo, Hawkeyes. The DVM MPH program is through both schools. Um, so, I actually had to reapply for my master's program, which is a different set. It looks just like VimCAS, which is like a little eye twitching. <laughs> I was like, dang, I have to do this again. Um, so, there's very rare circumstances where you can gain residency, but it's not related to transferring school or application. For instance, um, I knew I know an incoming third year who her parents moved out here for work. She was still a dependent, and she, after a semester, became a resident because that was some weird fluke circumstance. If you have a significant other that you are legally married to, sorry, I should have started that. If you're married to someone who gets transferred out here, um, also one of the rare exceptions but I moved out here actually June 1st um, I like to cause problems and I actually started my MPH coursework for the DVM MPH program before starting in the fall um, actually the past two weeks I've been here from 8 to 5 doing more MPH coursework but because I had so many units under my belt they let me do that and so I moved out here earlier being from out of state highly recommend for those of you streaming in um, if you can move out here before orientation that's idea but no it's kind of rare to get residency unfortunately I will not be one of those that figure the 160,000 ish yeah no um <laughs> mine with both of my degrees is probably going to be about 300,000 and that is something that I have come to grips with um and as an out-of-state student that didn't have an in-state school going to do. I know someone who moved to Colorado, got residency, and then applied. I think that's a big risk, and I don't recommend doing that, but I know people who did it here, too. So, it just depends. Everyone has a different path. So. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to a student who's 
going over your essays and briefly with the host. So we do have others that will do credit for you. I think it's two words. Yeah, um, I think I probably rewrote my essays like 10 times. <laughs> like if you looked at what they started at and ended at, it's not the same at all. Um, I probably read over it like 10 times myself before I let anybody else read it. Um, and I started with my mom just because she knows me um, and read through it and we worked through it a few times. Um, I went to one of my high school English teachers I know really well. Um, he worked through it with me and then I went, um, I guess this was, I started with Academic Success Center on campus. Um, I kind of started there um, as well. So um, just kind of everyone. Um, I recommend highly getting an academic person that like doesn't know vet school at all because they catch like grammatical things that like somebody reading through and understanding the veterinary profession might not catch because they understand what you're saying, if that makes sense at all. Um, so just having different people I also had the vet look over it too that I work with. So, yep. Um, I had my vet look over it. I actually exchanged essays with another applicant who wasn't applying to all of the same schools, but we sent each other our essays. Um, several of the schools I applied to, the supplementals were really, they had a lot more to it and I had to write longer. And so I included those, but I did have um, family members read it. Like if they could understand it, not knowing what the vet field looked like, that was really valuable. And I did have the um, vet who ended up being a letter of rec read over my essays just to make sure that it made sense from a veterinary standpoint as well. But look over it. Read it out loud. You'll yeah. catch a lot of mistakes if you read it out loud, like a speech. Um, especially for a school that doesn't do interviews, think of it as your interview. This is your opportunity to showcase yourself. 2,000 characters, including spaces. <laughs> and that's not a lot. You think about it, and it's really not a lot. And so my original essay was much longer because I didn't realize it included spaces. Yeah, and then I went, oh too. my God. Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get rid of so much. So yeah. just be aware. Um, but I do highly recommend reading it out loud. If you don't have anyone or if it's, you're not getting feedback from the people you've asked help. It's also a lot easier to add stuff than it is to remove stuff. So like try and keep it concise and then add in like experiences throughout it um, rather than have this really long essay that you have to remove things from. It makes it really hard um, and then choppy. Which I did that and had to rewrite. I also think a really good tip is don't say anything that the application itself isn't already saying. So you fill out your work experience and like what it did or awards that you got unless it's really valuable for you to elaborate on those, the application already says that. And 2,000 characters is not a lot, so don't repeat what the application says. This is your chance to actually have some you know, flavor to the application that's going to be different from other people. So definitely look over that, and if you see you know, yourself covering a lot of things that the application is already showcasing, I might go back and think, okay, well, what else? What about me makes me a worthy applicant? For me, like, I'm fluent in sign language. That's something that you won't necessarily get. Yeah, you'll read that my minor was in special education, but not the deaf emphasis. And so explaining the variety and how that's helped, and how I've signed with deaf animals and been able to communicate my behavior stuff, like, it's something that the, the application didn't necessarily go over better in depth, but it was something I could do. So I opened my application in May, like the day it opened. I'm sure all of you did the same. Um, <laughs> And I filled out like all of the easy stuff, like within the first week, like I had all my, like, I don't know, all the basic information. Um, and then I like tried to work on it, but it's so overwhelming. It's like such a big process that came July. Like I probably had like, aside from my essays, which I had like laid out, I had hardly any of my experiences entered. I had like them written out, but like I hadn't actually like done it. So I think the biggest thing that helped me was scheduling it. Like I would schedule times like a class, like I would go like and work on that. And I would just like try and knock out um, experiences one week and everything. And then I got done with it in like three weeks. It like really helps to break it down um, into small chunks and schedule it out. And then you get through it because it is overwhelming. and It's a long process, but it is doable and you'll get through it. I promise. I 
asked my letters of rec before the application opened and one of them no two of them submitted on the same day the day before it closed <laughs> want to do that <laughs> so anticipate people to disappoint you <laughs> um letters of rec wise it is really important don't just ask three um i knew someone who did and won my stuff that's a really very like heartbreaking to hear that knowing how much money went into that and so i recommend again scheduling time bother those people politely some of them are your bosses you might work with them but you know this is a this is about you this is your future and if someone is taking their time and not submitting letters like on a reasonable basis like I anticipated not actually having those two letters because of how like long it had been like it's September and I don't have my letters I'm like all right cool I've bothered you guys like once a week I see you once a week plus um for me I remember times and this is gonna sound super sad but <laughs> I remember times being in the shower and just crying, thinking like, wow, like, what if I'm just not enough? What if like this whole, this, it's a grueling process. It's rough. And there's a lot of anxiety associated with it. Um, not as someone with like clinical depression and anxiety, like it adds to it. You are constantly double guessing like whether it's like you're worth this whole process. And I think that it's important that you take a step back from that and realize that you are. Kind of going back to what I said earlier, be patient with yourself. Realize that you're not the only one doing this. And you really shouldn't think about like all of the other people applying. You should take care of yourself. And so if you break it down into smaller chunks, it becomes a lot more manageable. And if you have plans for, okay, what if you don't? What if I get waitlisted? What happens? Um, flip side of that is what if I get waitlisted and I get pulled off the waitlist a week before? That, ha that has happened. <laughs> yeah, yes, that has happened. And so always have a plan because then you're able to sort of control all of those unknown variables. There's still going to be some, like whether you get in or not, that you can't control, but make it manageable for you and your schedule, whether you're working or still in school. Um, I would have been a little more patient with myself. I had a lot of external pressure, like, so have you heard anything back? And then it's like, once you hear things back, so have you decided? And then once you've decided, so when are you leaving? I'm like, I just, I want, this process is sacred to you, you know? Um, and yes, everyone wants to be there for you. So have a good support team. When you are struggling and you feel like you're not enough, reach out to those people. They might not know exactly what this process is like, but they're there for you. They're not even there for the process. They are just supporting of you as an individual. And so I had a really good support team. I had really good friends. And I did have friends also applying at the same time. And we all had those moments. Sometimes we're like, you know what, we're just going to go out to dinner and not worry about Vimcast because it's stressful. So um, being patient with yourself, and that's what I would have done. Been a little more patient and kind to myself because at the end of the day, I did end up here. I did make it. And so no matter where you guys end up, be patient with yourself. Be kind to yourself. One other thing, going off the letter of Rex, um, it lets you set a due date. So I set all of my letter of recs due date as August 1st, even though we have yep. till the 15th, um, because I did have people wait till last minute and submit it on like July 31st. And that would have stressed me out personally, knowing myself, because I like to do things ahead of time. So I set their due date ahead of time. So that way it was, I don't know, even though it was last minute for them, it was still ahead of time for the application. So. So I set my due date as like June 15th <laughs> <laughs> and those two still, <laughs> I was like, hey. And be, when you do badger them, be polite. These are individuals who are going to be your colleagues. So uh, the veterinarians especially. And so be kind but firm <laughs> <laughs> that this is your life and it's really important. And then offer them a way out. I did have that happen for my MPH application, not for my vet application. I had someone kept prolonging, prolonging. And I was like, you know what? If it's too much, I will find someone else. And that's all they wanted to hear. And they're like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. Like, I was really worried that I just wasn't going to apply. I'm like, they're going to ghost me in an application. That's it's just so, <laughs> it's very unprofessional. And I will never ask them for a rec again. But offer that way out. If you're already thinking, like, maybe this is going to be a problem, don't stress about it. Don't let them stress about it. It's not worth it. Um, again, I think you probably mentioned this. Ask for a positive letter of recommendation. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. I have read negative letters of recommendation. I don't know why that individual would write that, but if you just ask for a letter of rec, a letter of recommendation, it does not guarantee that it's going to be in your favor. So 
Um, I have written several letters of recommendation myself. I forgot to include this part of my lengthy work experience. As a graduate student at the University of Arizona, I taught two microbiology courses um, as a lab TA, and so I have written several letters of rec for them. I have written letters of rec for pharmacy school and med school, and I've seen their application process, and it's very similar. So going back to vet school's professional school, it is. Um, make sure that those people are in your corner and they're actually gonna write you a positive letter of recommendation. Because <laughs> it's almost heartbreaking to read an entire letter of someone essentially like putting them through the ringer and that person went and asked them for a recommendation letter and assuming it was gonna be positive. So be aware, not all people are going to be nice. Do you guys have any questions about vet school? I know you guys all have tour guides today, but I'm sure my information is somewhere. Yeah, I can get um, it. You guys are interested in dual degree programs and what that looks like in general. Um, I had insight about the MPH program, but it's very similar. So if you're interested in stuff like that, if you want to know what it's like or living or anything like that, if you're not from around here or even just around Ames, either of us probably will be participating. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank you.